Tonight, the man accused of killing a Toronto police officer is not guilty. Canada didn't let injustice to happen, so I thank Canada. The emotional verdict, the judge's apology, and the chaotic and tragic moments that led up to the officer's death. A teenager poisoned by carbon monoxide at his part-time job. He was basically at death's door. But his employer faced no penalty. The calls for change when serious injuries happen at work. High hopes for hockey fans. Four Canadian teams are in the playoffs. I think they're a good squad, and uh, I think this year's different. The chances a Canadian team could break the 31-year Stanley Cup drought. From CBC News, this is The National with Ian Hennemansing. The man accused of running down and murdering a Toronto police officer has been acquitted. After four days of deliberations, the jury returned a not guilty verdict in a trial that pitted the word of police against experts. Umar Zamir said he thought his family was in danger when plainclothes officers approached him in a parking garage in 2021. He said he never intended to run over and kill Detective Constable Jeffrey Northrup, the defense describing it all as a tragic accident. After the verdict, the judge took the rare step of apologizing to Zamir for what he'd been put through. Jamie Strachan now with the emotional reaction and what the trial revealed. Umar Zamir walked out of the Toronto courthouse into the cool spring air, a free man, full of relief. I never meant any of this to happen. I am sorry for what had happened. Zamir and his family burst into tears after a jury found him not guilty of all criminal charges, including first-degree murder in the death of Toronto police officer Jeffrey Northrup, bringing to a close a nightmarish three years. I and Ida made a wrong decision when we thought we should go to Canada. But I think today I see that Canada didn't let injustice to happen. Rewind to Canada Day weekend nearly three years ago. After celebrating, Zamir, his pregnant wife and two-year-old son passed by a man who had been stabbed as they returned to their car in the dimly lit parking lot below Toronto City Hall. Once inside, two people approached their vehicles, banging on the windows. It was Northrop and his partner, both dressed in plain clothes, investigating the stabbing. Zamir testified neither identified themselves as police, that he feared they were criminals. This case will mark a teachable moment uh, for, for many uh, police agencies, for many Canadians, about how we want police to act, how they should act, uh, especially when they're in plain clothes. This is the driver. Okay. He's under arrest right now. Zamir reversed and accelerated toward the exit, knocking Northrop down. Experts from both sides testified. They also told the court Northrop was already on the ground when he was run over. But three police officers testified he was standing with his hands up. The judge was critical of what she called the Crown's morphing narrative and, after the verdict, apologized to Zamir for what he's been through. Thankfully, the jury saw the case for what it was, a tragedy, an outright tragedy, but not a criminal offence. For Northrop's family and the Toronto police, more questions, more heartache. I am very disappointed in today's outcome. From day one, all I've wanted is accountability. We miss Jeff every day. I share the feelings of our members who were hoping for a different outcome. While exactly what happened in that garage may never be known, what is certain is a man was killed and lives changed forever. Jamie Strachan, CBC News, Toronto. Now to a go-public investigation, a Saskatchewan family is speaking out tonight after their teenage son suffered carbon monoxide poisoning at work. As they told Rosa Marcatelli, their son could have died, but his employer faced no serious consequences. This is Will Kratenko in his uniform on the first day of his first part-time job. Just a few months later, the then 14-year-old was poisoned at work after a supervisor told him to clean enclosed areas in the meat department of this grocery store with a gas-powered pressure washer. I started feeling lightheaded and dizzy. Will staggered to the front of the store and collapsed. He was rushed to hospital with severe carbon monoxide poisoning. He was basically at death's door. 
Another teen got sick just the day before, the same way, according to text messages between that employee and a supervisor. According to the workplace safety report, both teens were not supervised and had not received safety training on how to use the gas pressure washer. If he would have passed out in that meat department alone with the pressure washer on, he could have been dead right there. Despite all of that, there was no penalty for the employer. The family couldn't believe it. The problem? A lot of provinces can't issue hefty fines directly to companies who put workers in harm's way. Instead, they can issue orders to fix violations, or they can try to pursue hefty fines in court, which is expensive and time consuming. We need other tools. So for serious incidents like this, where for whatever reason there isn't going to be a prosecution, that there can be a significant financial penalty. The grocery store tells Go Public the gas pressure washer, similar to this one, was unauthorized, brought in by an employee who no longer works there, saying it will ensure an incident like this never happens again. Will says he hasn't been the same since he was poisoned at work. I have headaches. I, it's hard to focus when I'm grabbing my head and like thinking about the headaches that are happening all the time. Carbon monoxide poisoning can lead to long-term health problems. It's the unknown, right? It's really the unknown. What's your essay on? <laughs> the family says they want to advocate for more severe consequences. But for now, they're focusing on Will's health. Rosa Marcatelli, CBC News, Calgary. Our Go Public stories come from you. If you have a tip for the team to investigate, send an email to gopublic at cbc.ca. At least 15 people were hurt in a tram accident at Universal Studios' popular Hollywood theme park last night. All right, that's the, I think that's the last ambulance. Officials say the tram was on a studio tour and was making a turn when the last car hit the guardrail and tipped over, throwing passengers out. Most of the injuries were minor. Tomorrow, all eyes will be on a Manhattan courtroom where opening statements are set to begin in Donald Trump's criminal trial. He is the first U.S. president to face criminal prosecution. Sasha Petrasik now on how this historic trial could play out. American history's being made here. Never before has a U.S. president been put on criminal trial. Now, Donald Trump is facing a case that threatens his political future. It's a rigged trial. Our courts, everything is screwed up in New York, and the whole world is watching. Prosecutors accuse Trump of falsifying business records to cover up paying a porn star, Stormy Daniels, to bury her story of their sexual encounter. This to keep it from endangering his run for the White House in 2016. In court, Trump sat fuming last week as 12 jurors were chosen. I seriously doubt that Donald Trump will be able to contain himself. LaDoris Cordell is a former Supreme Court judge in California. So if he fails to contain himself during the opening statements, if he starts saying something or, or conducts himself in a matter that is absolutely inappropriate or disruptive, then you know what? He'll be facing a contempt charge. The prosecution's star witness is likely Michael Cohen, the former Trump fixer who handled his hush money. Trouble is, he's lied in court before. He's a convicted perjurer. So they're going to say, you really can't rely on those facts. If convicted, Trump faces up to four years in jail. But he could get house arrest. He could be incarcerated in his home with an ankle bracelet, which would be something to behold. Trump's supporters are crying foul, saying he can't get a fair trial in Democratic New York. To do it conveniently during a presidential election when he's campaigning to return to the White House, I think, proves that this is all politically motivated. And Sasha, this may be the only trial that wraps up before the November election. That's right, Ian. It's certainly the only one that seems to be steaming ahead out of four criminal cases currently underway. Trump is accused of trying to interfere in the 2020 election in Georgia and of conspiring to stop it from being certified here in Washington. That's the January 6th storming of Capitol Hill. He's also on trial for retaining classified documents at his Mar-a-Lago estate in Florida, if you remember. Now, all the rest of these have been bogged down in legal challenges, something his lawyers are very good at. Sasha Petrasik.
in Washington. Social media giant TikTok says freedom of speech is at risk for millions of Americans if the U.S. acts on a proposed law that would let it ban the platform. Sarah Levitt shows us why that law is now closer to reality and whether Canada is taking note. Eyes have it. The amendments are adopted. With an overwhelming majority, the U.S. House of Representatives brought a potential ban on TikTok one step closer. Part of a sweeping foreign aid bill, the legislation would hand an ultimatum to the app's parent company, ByteDance, which is partly Chinese-owned. Sell within a year or face an outright ban. At risk, lawmakers say, is U.S. national security. They have concerns that U.S. data um, could be accessed by the Chinese government. There are other fears, given that the TikTok algorithm is controlled by ByteDance. In theory, the Chinese government could influence content being how it's displayed or recommended. But TikTok's CEO says ByteDance is not an agent of China or any other country, and a ban would trample the free speech rights of its users, users who aren't happy. And they're trying to ban the most popular app in the world. I don't recognize how insidious this is. It is definitely scary. For some, a ban could spell lost revenue. I think all of us right now are kind of trying to pick up more on Instagram and other platforms too, just in case. Like, we hope... Our um, followers obviously follow us everywhere, but that doesn't happen all the time. In Canada, TikTok was banned last year from all government-issued phones. As for an all-out ban? I don't think right now that there's going to be a ban north of the north of the border. But if it does get banned in the United States and actually gets pulled from the App Store, um, if it does reach that, I think the conversations would definitely be uh, restarted up here. The U.S. bill still has to make its way to the Senate and then be signed by U.S. President Joe Biden, something he says he'll do. Then the deadline will be on for TikTok to decide what it does next. Sarah Levitt, CBC News, Montreal. Investigators are looking into the cause of a major fire that consumed buildings in Happy Valley Goose Bay in Labrador. Can't uh, speculate the cause, but uh, the Fire and Emergency Services uh, fire investigator is in town to work with the RCMP. This is a scene on Friday as part of the town was under a state of emergency. The fire was first reported at a ceramic shop and then spread to an old airport hangar, causing explosions. More pushback tonight to Ottawa's planned capital gains tax hike, just days after it was announced in the government's budget. Some warn it could harm the economy. J.P. Tasker explains. Ottawa's tax hike on big capital gains has been framed as a tax on the rich. But some entrepreneurs say it threatens Canada's overall economy. Any time taxes go up, it takes dollars out of the economy. I'm going to have less of an opportunity to deploy that capital into the next startup. In Tuesday's budget, the federal government announced it was increasing the tax on capital gains, the profits earned from an asset sale. Businesses will pay tax on two-thirds of those gains, up from half. That will also apply to some people who report a gain of $250,000 or more. But with the economy stuck in neutral and productivity slumping, it's a mistake, this investor says. Right now, we're in a place where we desperately need more investment. The plan is also getting bad reviews from some of the premiers. It's the same old liberal plan, stick your hands in someone's pocket, tax the death out of people. But Canada's finance minister says it won't affect that many people. We are asking those at the very top to pay a little bit more. As an individual, you only start paying a little more after your first $250,000 in capital gains. The capital gains hike isn't the only thing that has premiers up in arms. They're overtaxing, overspending, overborrowing, and over interfering in provincial affairs. In a recent letter, all 13 premiers accuse Ottawa of encroaching on their jurisdiction, with plans to spend billions more on housing, pharmacare, and a new dental program. Trudeau says he's only spending more because premiers aren't doing enough. I'd always rather work with provinces, but if we have to, I will go around them and be there for Canadians. Conservative leader Pierre Polyev has condemned the capital gains hike. He says Canadians already pay enough in taxes. But NDP leader Jagmeet Singh wants the Liberals to squeeze even more money out of the rich and big corporations. He's demanding some changes before agreeing to support the budget. J.P. Tasker, CBC News, Ottawa. Israel is pushing back against a reported plan by the U.S. to sanction an Israeli military unit after the 2022 death of an elderly Palestinian-American man who was detained in the West Bank. 
אני אלחם בזה בכל כוחותיי. Israel's Prime Minister is vowing to fight the move, which hasn't been formally announced. That's expected as early as Monday and would be unprecedented. Israeli leaders and media have identified the group as an ultra-Orthodox unit that's no longer in the West Bank, but is helping fight the war in Gaza. That incident dates back to before the attack by Hamas on October 7th, but since then, violence in the West Bank has surged, including between Palestinians and Israeli settlers in the occupied territory. Chris Brown shows us the aftermath of one deadly clash. A terrifying wave of Israeli settler violence has engulfed the West Bank. We've come to the Palestinian village of Al Mukhair to witness the aftermath. The settlers besieged the house, Abdel Latif Abdu Alia told us, and the Israeli army helped them. The scenes from that day show masked Israeli settlers, some with guns, others throwing rocks, and members of Israel's military present, but seemingly not acting to stop the rampage. It was triggered after a 14-year-old Israeli settler, Binyamin Achimer, went missing after taking his sheep out to graze. The settler's mob rampaged even before his body was found. This blood-soaked pillow is where Abu Alia tried to save the life of his cousin Jihad Abu Alia, who was killed after someone on the ground shot him in the head. The 25-year-old was due to be married in two months. You can see the bullets all over the walls. You can see how the blood spilled all over the place, he said. On duty at the local clinic that day was Dr. Ayad Nassan. People start bringing me like uh, injuries, all kind of injuries, a gunshot in their feet, in their legs, in their knees, in their chest. He told us the security forces manning Israeli checkpoints obstructed the injured from reaching help. Since Hamas's attack on Israeli communities on October the 7th, settler violence against Palestinians in the West Bank has soared in attacks that Human Rights Watch says are condoned by Israel's government. So settlers know that they can get away with doing it. They are armed by the Israeli government. Um, they are sometimes directly encouraged to carry out attacks, and they're doing so in more and more areas that the Israeli government covets for settlements. Among the other victims of the violence was Shepherd Imad Abu Alia. He says they set his barn on fire before killing some sheep and stealing the rest, 120 animals in total. I want them back because I brought them up, he said. Do you ever replace your children? They're like my children. Rights groups say the theft of livestock and the construction of herding outposts is one of the new tactics settlers are using to deprive Palestinian families of an income and ultimately force many to abandon their land. And Chris, what is Israel's military saying about what happened in this case? Ian, in a statement, the IDF told us the 14-year-old Israeli teen was killed in an act of terrorism, but they didn't provide any more details. The IDF also said complaints about soldiers' behavior will be examined. Regarding ambulances being held up, the IDF said that happened for security checks. Israel human rights group Yesh Din says over a 17-year period, 93% of investigations against settlers who attacked Palestinians were closed without any charges. Ian. Chris Brown in Jerusalem. A recent report shows Canadian renters with disabilities are at a higher risk of being evicted. Maybe I should hang on to that trailer. I might have to live in it someday. How that heightened fear is hurting families. But first. Strap yourselves in for the best ride in sports. The NHL playoffs are here, and hopes are high for Canadian teams. There is one that could do it. Plus, a family pet lost in Ontario found on PEI. It's an absolute miracle that, uh, that he, he's here. We're back in two. This wildfire near Quinell in the B.C. interior is still burning tonight after growing to more than 16 square kilometres in just a day. B.C.'s wildfire service says people were to blame for seven fires that started on Saturday. The other six are either under control or out. 
Canadian renters who have a disability seem to be at greater risk of being evicted. That's according to survey data released by Statistics Canada. As Yvette Bren shows us, finding a suitable new home can be especially difficult. Hey, Bren. Every time eviction uproots this disabled man's family, the hunt for a new home gets harder. I have a good job and I can't afford to buy a home. And I, which means I can't support my son 100% by keeping him safe in one place. A recent survey found that 3% of Canadian renters have been evicted. Of those, more than a quarter reported living with a disability. Um, I feel very, very vulnerable because if we ever had to leave this home and now I have to make a resume of my family and then I have to, you know, include in there, oh, must modify the bathroom, must put a ceiling lift in. Um, we have two dogs, is that okay? There's a back pillow that, you know, one of those travel pillows, I use that. This, John Fedick used to help people find car. housing. Now the former social services worker lives in his car. I wasn't prepared for the shock of it. I wasn't prepared for um, the battles I've had to face with other people. He's faced three evictions and he says a lot of discrimination due to his disabilities. Every eviction ups the risk of homelessness, an yeah, additional yeah. level of stress. So we definitely see that those, those folks who experience an eviction end up being worse off because they almost invariably pay more uh, when they secure a new place to live. Maybe I should hang on to that trailer. I might have to live in it someday with my son and my partner and our dogs. Molly, come. For some, getting shut out can put a new roof out of reach. Yvette Bren, CBC News, Vancouver. Four Canadian teams are fighting for the Stanley Cup and fans are buying in. The team's looking good, they're looking fast. Why some analysts think Canada's slump could come to an end. Plus. Noah Kahn, one of music's top rising stars, and how falling asleep led to one of his top tracks. The song has completely changed everything about my life. And changes could be coming to Canada's mortgage rules, but will it make buying a home more attainable? The bank can give you half a million dollar loan, but can you truly afford that? The National breaks down the stories shaping our world. Next. After a strong start, Canadian golf star Brooke Henderson had to settle for a shared third-place finish at the 2024 Chevron Championship in Texas today. She and American Lauren Coughlin both finished at 10 under par. The big winner, Florida's Nellie Corda, who shot 13 under. Her win ties an LPGA record for five straight tournament victories. Here at home, there's growing hope Canada's 31-year Stanley Cup drought will finally end with four Canadian teams in the playoff hunt this year. Toronto, Winnipeg, Edmonton, and Vancouver. Georgie Smythe now on what stands between them and the Cup. The Leafs may have lost their first playoff game, but hope is still high. Hopefully it's something different this year. I think they're a good squad, and uh, I think this year's different. And they're not the only ones riding the wave. Four Canadian teams made the playoffs this year, the highest number in seven years. Toronto, Winnipeg, Edmonton and Vancouver all battling for Canada's first Stanley Cup in 31 years when the Montreal Canadiens hoisted the cup. Still, this hockey analyst urges fans not to get ahead of themselves. And I don't sit here at the start of every playoffs in April going, could this be the year? I just am excited to watch playoff hockey. Spirits are high in Winnipeg after the Jets closed their season with eight straight wins. The team's looking good, they're looking fast, so I want to see the people flock to the downtown area. Go Jets, go! We are Winnipeg! But Edmonton fans have their own reasons to be hopeful, not least Connor McDavid, widely considered the best player in the world. We've learned a lot of lessons, as you said, from, uh, from our many failures and, and you know that's what uh, that's what great teams do. Pundits say McDavid may be Canada's best bet. There is one that could do it 
I think it would be the Edmonton Oilers that, that most, most of us feel would uh, champion, could possibly be a Stanley Cup winner. But Vancouver fans might disagree after the Canucks finished first in their division. I want the Vancouver Canucks to win, and if it's not them, it doesn't have to be a team from Canada, but I could see where many fans from across the country, around the country, may want a Canadian team to break that 30-year curse for sure. After failing to make the playoffs since 2020, Canucks fans are down here at Rogers Arena looking for redemption and hoping that that home ice advantage makes a difference in the first two games against Nashville. Georgie Smythe, CBC News, Vancouver. Now it's time to dig deeper into the stories shaping our world. The housing crisis hits a new low. I feel like a lot of people are kind of losing hope. Why it's harder than ever to buy a home, but first. After years of making music, Noah Khan blows up on TikTok. To get that validation, I really needed that at that time. The raw honesty that helped propel him to start. Maybe I don't have any idea who I am because I've just been dancing around it for so many years. This is The Breakdown. Tom Power, the host of CBC's Q, caught up with Noah Kahn just before the singer performed three sold-out shows in Toronto in front of some 60,000 fans. What's really been amazing um, for, for me to see is just watching so many people fill these halls um, singing along to songs that are really about something about love and, and loneliness, about, about drugs and booze, about, about mental health. And watching all those fans scream those lyrics back to him, it's hard not to be moved by that. And I'm so excited to say uh, that Noah Khan joins me in the studio now to talk about it. How are you? Good. Thanks so much for having me and for that lovely introduction. Very kind. I mean, how many are you doing? The three nights at Scotiabank here in Toronto? Three nights, yeah, which is crazy. You that, know? Yeah, it's meaningful to you, I bet. Yeah, just walking around and seeing like the Drake insignia all over the place like this is like his it seems like he has his, his fingerprints all over that venue and it's like wow i'm playing where drake plays that's pretty cool and um you know just like a moment when you're like watching the raptors on tv and then remembering that you're selling shows out at that venue it's pretty cool a lot of what i want to talk to you about today is sort of this idea of like hey i i i the music i was writing before it wasn't really authentic to me and now the music i write is authentic to my life and it's working out really well is, was there like an aha moment where you're like, I got to write some songs that are a bit more true? I don't think there was one moment where I was like, this isn't making me happy anymore. I need to go to the mountains, you know? Like, <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't like, it wasn't as like cliche or as like stereotypical as that. It was, I was just kind of tired of, um, of the process more than I was the result. Like, I feel like the songs I put out, I do, I did care about. It's just the way that I got to them was becoming so much harder. Like, you know, I was going to sessions in New York where I was living at the time, like simply because I had roommates that were like working nine to fives and I wanted to like work a nine to five myself in the music industry. Right. Cause I always felt like this isn't a real job. Yeah. I make my own schedule. I'm terribly unstructured in my, yeah. in my brain and my life. And like, yeah, I need to like wake up in the morning and go to the studio, you know, like sidebar here, but like stick season, I wrote in like 25 minutes after a session, like, and the song has completely changed everything about my life. Like fundamentally. Can we, can we listen to a little bit of it? Are you tired of it? Forever, now you still can't call me back and I love her more, but it's the season of the sticks and I saw your mom, she forgot that I existed and it's half my fault, but I just like to play the victim of drink alcohol till my friends come home for Christmas and I'll dream each night. I got goosebumps, I love that song. I love this song too, man. Like, I still love it. I love how much joy it brings people when they hear it. Can, can you go back to what you were saying that you like? The, yeah. Because um, I'm 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 sort of obsessed with the where and when of people who write the song. I think I think the story of this song is like emblematic of like why the record was important to me, and it was like a good like microcosm for like a larger issue in my life at that time. Look at all those big words I just said. Um, Killed it. I was recording my second album. I was I am, and uh, I wrote the first verse to stick season and I was thinking about how I had to buy weed from high school kids as like a 23 year old Ooh. guy. And I was like, I have to like, the only way I can, I'm like alone at home and I'm like buying weed from this like 18 year old kid. And like, you know, I have to go to like <laughs> drive into like the pizza parlor in town. I just felt like a loot, like yeah. a, like I felt like a, like a washed up 
guy in my career. Yeah. And then I was at home and I felt like a washed up dude in, in like in my life. Yeah. Even though it had like at that point like a, hundreds of millions of streams and I've yeah. toured for a long time, it's just like I just still felt like I think I felt so disconnected from the music that to me I felt like I didn't even have a job. Yeah. Uh, and so I started writing about that and like I posted on TikTok and like you know was going to bed and was doing that thing where you're like refreshing to see if it's like doing well. Um, and it wasn't like no one was commenting on it or whatever. And I was like, man, do I just delete this shit? Like I'm such a, I'm so like, I succumb to like the social media success of something really easily. And, yeah. uh, which is like one of my least favorite qualities about yeah, myself. It's the worst. Uh, no, sorry. It's not, I don't mean it's the worst quality of yourself. Worst, I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Narcissist. When you were on the way in, someone said, if you could mirror his internal dialogue to him, that'd be helpful. <laughs> <laughs> it's helping and you're nailing it. Even the voice. Um, not great. No, no but I know what you're saying. No, it is like, it's, it's something that I, I, we I, all sorry, fall into. I am, I am agreeing with you because it's something that I try to, I, I lie to people and say, I don't do. Yeah, we but, all lie about it. it. Everyone it, likes yeah. the way it feels to see people interacting with something you yeah, post. Yeah. And everyone hates the way it feels to see nobody doing it. Yeah, right. And so I was like, I'm going to delete this shit. And then I like fell asleep. Woke up the next morning and the song had like done a lot of uh, a lot of numbers on, on TikTok for my, like at my following at that point. Like it was blowing up. Thousands of comments, hundreds of thousands of likes. I was like, oh, cool. And, and then I wrote the chorus uh, that next morning kind of with that like pep in my step. Of like, cool, people like it. Here's a chorus, you know? And um, yeah, posted it, posted it, and that did well as well. What I like about it is that you get this moment where you go, oh my God, that verse really works. Now I can write a chorus. Totally. Yeah, totally. And like, what was cool, and like, I genuinely mean this, like, of course, a lot of this song was driven by like the fact that people liked it already. But I think I needed to hear that. I was so low confidence in my songwriting. And like, beyond the point of being critical or being like constructively critical, I was like, everything sucks. And like, it felt really good to write something that felt like a little different from what I was making. It was about Vermont, which is like, I didn't think people were going to relate to. It was really just for me. And to see all these people be like, hey, I love this idea. I'm like, cool. Like, there's a lane for this feeling that I have in my songwriting right now, which is like, I can write about what I care about at home by myself, not needing to be in a, in a multi million dollar studio or with a big time producer. Like, people want to hear what I have to say. Um, and that felt really cool, like to get that validation. I really needed that at that time. Can I can I ask you about uh, can I ask you about growing sideways? Yeah, of course. Can we take a listen to it? So I forgot my medication, fell into a manic high. Spend my savings at a Lulu. Now I'm suffering in style. Why is pain so impatient? Ain't like it's got That's a place. Noah Khan with Growing Sideways from his album Stick Season. Um, a couple of things on that. One is I heard you do an introduction of it, and you said, uh, I've been thinking about all the years I spent lying to therapists. Mm -hmm. When I was writing Growing Sideways, that was like a, a fundamental fear of mine, was that I had like just drifted through life without any idea of who I actually was or what I was actually feeling. And and uh, and that scared me. Uh, and I also, like the second verse, you know, felt, took stopped taking my medication, like went and spent all my money. Like I, I from a real experience I had when I first went on Prozac and I, uh, went cold turkey off of it. Which, oh, no. Which you're really not supposed to do. It's, hard on, it's really yeah. hard on you. And so I was just thinking about that, and then I started thinking about uh, my experience in therapy. Like, I was very privileged growing up. I grew up in a nice area with a family of, of who were able to afford to send me to therapy when I was eight or nine, you know? Yeah. And the truth is, like, I was going to therapy, but I wasn't in therapy. I was just putting on a performance. Yeah. Um, and I did that for a long time. And, uh, and so I was writing about kind of that feeling of, like, maybe I have don't have any idea who I am because I've just been dancing around it for so many years. It's amazing to see at your shows when you're singing about this stuff, when you say the word like, so I went to see my therapist and a crowd of 18, 19, 20, 21 year olds flips out yeah and it's the, crazy it, but in addition to it being wild it also just means that like it's okay to to have those experiences now were you like like when you were going when you were eight were you was it okay did you feel like okay yeah, i can do this i spend a lot of time writing about mental health in my songs and like writing about my anxiety and my fear and depression and like that is awesome i think like it's cool that i'm able that i do that whatever um but like for me like being able to support that like and give the kid, give people an opportunity that you might not have had, like, yeah. to not feel ashamed or to feel weird about it, or to have a panic attack before you go to therapy. Mm -hmm. Like, 
that's something that I can do um, and that I can help make happen. And like, you know, I'm playing for two, know, three nights at Scotiabank. I don't know how many people are. It's like a, 60, 60, people. 60, thousand people. Sixty thousand people are three nights. Hopefully, going to leave feeling like they can talk about yeah uh, mental health because I did. Hopefully, that's the goal. Um, and, so and, it's an opportunity. Man, it's 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 quite a story. Thank um, you. But all sort of. Uh, uh, held down, uh, everything you've told me of all this instability has been really held down by just undeniably great songs. Thank you, man. I uh, appreciate you coming in. Yeah, I appreciate your questions. Thanks a lot. Noah Khan also got candid about dealing with his sudden fame. You can catch that in the full 40-minute interview now available on Q's YouTube page or the Q podcast through the CBC Listen app. Getting into Canada's housing market is harder than ever, and some realtors are predicting another frenzy. The minute that interest rates drop, demand will increase substantially. What's behind the ongoing affordability crisis? Next. facts for Canadians feeling shut out of the housing market. They're feeling, hey, wait a second, we followed the rules. This really is one of the worst times for affording a home, even though interest rates have been way higher. Regular people, they were able to purchase a home. So is there any relief in sight? Well, maybe a little. Andrew Chang, host of CBC's About That, breaks down the numbers to show how the cost of housing is squeezing budgets and why lower interest rates may not be the answer. All right, so if you're in your 20s or early 30s looking to buy a home in Canada and your parents ever told you, well, back in the 90s, I had to pay... Okay, no one talks like that. If your parents ever told you back in the 90s, they had to pay 15% interest on their mortgage, way more than the shocking rates of 5, 6, 7% today, that's 100% true. But what's not true is that home ownership was harder back then. According to RBC economists, even though mortgage rates were twice or even three times higher in the early 90s, it was actually easier to buy a home then than it is now. And in fact, some say right now, 2024, could be the hardest it's ever been to buy a home in this country. Let's try to understand why. So yes, paying 15% interest on a mortgage in the early 90s, that was killer. But when a house in Toronto only cost around $250,000 and the median household income was about $59,000, that's not really comparable to today. I mean, what is the house price compared to income? Not quite 5x, more like 4x because that same house in Toronto now costs more than four times as much money, $1.1 million, and household income hasn't even doubled. I mean, the ratios are all out of whack. Back in the 90s, like, sure, the interest rates were really high, right? We're, we're talking about double-digit interest rates, uh, but housing prices were a lot lower. Uh, and, you know, regular people blue collared, white collared, whatever it is, you know, they, they were able to purchase a home. They were able to afford the payment despite the high rates. In many cases, that's no longer the case, especially in certain parts of the country. According to that RBC report in Toronto, for an average income household, it now costs around 85% of your paycheck to pay for an average priced home. In Vancouver, it's your entire paycheck. And in most other major cities, Still pretty high, somewhere around 40 to 50 percent. Averaged out across the country, that's about 64 percent of the median household income now required to buy a home in Canada. 46 percent for a condo, 70 percent for a single detached house. What this all adds up to, not once in the past four decades has home ownership in Canada been this out of reach. Just look at this massive spike over the past couple of years. That is, of course, during the Bank of Canada's historic rate hiking campaign and when the percentage of the median income required to own a home shot up from about 40% to over 60%. As you can see, there was a spike back in 1990 as well, when it cost around 56% of the median household income. That was in the middle of a recession, interest rates also shooting up at the time, but it was relatively temporary. By 1991, a year later, it was back down to 46%. 
Today, we've been hovering around the 60% mark nationally for a full two years. Now, if I Google how much of my total income should I spend on housing, let me tell you, it's nowhere near 60%. And I'll just read you the first result that comes up here. No more than 30% to 32% of your gross annual income should go to mortgage expenses, such as principal, interest, property taxes, heating costs, and condo fees. The CMHC, which regulates mortgages in Canada, still considers this a uh, useful benchmark. Others aren't so sure, and many Canadians are now well outside of that range. I mean, when it comes to mortgage lending guidelines, lenders will qualify customers for more than uh, what they actually can afford, unfortunately. Sure, the bank can give you half a million dollar loan, but can you truly afford that? So it's not exactly surprising that most Canadians, 76% who have yet to dive into the market, say it's out of reach. And they're saying, nope, now is not the time to throw my hat into this ring. I feel like a lot of people are kind of losing hope, uh, especially in the major cities like Toronto and Vancouver. They're feeling, hey, wait a second, we followed the rules, we played the game, but we still can't do it. Okay, so it's bleak. You're wondering, is there any relief in sight? Well, maybe a little. The authors of this report are operating on what's now become a pretty universal prediction, that the Bank of Canada will begin to lower rates sometime this year and will continue to do so into 2025. And of course, that's a huge part of this equation. Uh, I think there'll, there'll be celebrations on the street <laughs> at this point, you know, it'll be a, uh, our own proverbial Mardi Gras that are happening in our districts to see that borrowing costs declining. If loans become more affordable, then housing becomes more affordable. These economists figure it might drop down next year to around 56% of the median household income, but that's still a lot. And it's partly offset by the fact that while loans get less expensive, the price of the actual houses are expected to get more expensive. The minute that interest rates drop, demand will increase substantially, you know, and not to the same same capacity whatsoever. Falling rates are a double-edged sword. They help with affordability in the sense that we all pay less interest, but they also entice more people currently on the sidelines to dip a toe into the market, including some of the millions of new Canadians that moved here over the last couple of years, who will all be competing for a very limited supply of homes. We had a, a gentleman list a property within the real estate brokerage in which I'm located a few days ago. He had 78 showings and 38 offers in today's interest rate environment. How does one compete? At this point, most economists agree that not even a severe recession would bring truly balanced prices to Canada's most expensive markets, which is why for politicians and policymakers in this country, it is all hands on deck to try to figure out a solution. And so lots of attention on the interest rate that Andrew mentioned. The governor of the Bank of Canada confirmed we could see it get lower soon. The next update will be on June the 5th. After going missing during a move from Ontario to PEI, a family's beloved cat is finally home. It's an absolute miracle that, uh, that he, he's here. The mystery behind his journey is next in our moment. <coughs> This is Riley the cat, safe and sound in his owner's arms, but not before a mysterious journey that included a two-week gap. That gap came after a move from Ontario to PEI, during which Riley escaped, and while his owners couldn't find him, luckily, Riley found them, and tonight, that reunion is our moment. It's an absolute miracle that, uh, that he, he's here. We were on our way from uh, just outside London, to uh, come to PEI to move here permanently. On the way, we stopped about three and a half hours in at Port Hope. We went to let the dogs out, and he got out at the same time. And then we went and looked underneath, he was gone, disappeared. Couldn't find him. We were both very upset, and we talked to many people, and nobody knew anything about him. As soon as we landed on the island, I went to the dealership, and a gentleman there looked under the hood, he looked under the vehicle in three different places, but there was no sign of him. Two weeks later, 
He was sitting on the steps out in the backyard and uh, Riley appeared. I said to him, are you Riley? He just looked at me and then all of a sudden he went, meow. And then he ran and he just ran into my arms. He's got a little orange half mustache on the right hand side. So that's how we knew for sure it was him. He just settled right in as like, like nothing happened. <laughs> So to be clear, here, here's the mystery that he had disappeared when they made that stop not far from where they began in London, Ontario, and then he reappeared on the island. The only theory they have is that somehow Riley hid somewhere in the engine compartment, but that's 1,500 kilometers, and then took off before they went to that garage and then found the home. Still doesn't make sense, but anyway, it ended with him safe and sound. Thanks for being with us. You can watch anywhere, anytime on the free CBC News app and subscribe to the Nationals YouTube channel. I'm Ian Hanneman, singing in Vancouver. See you tomorrow night.